Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the launch of the Prescribed Burning Atlas, hosted by the Bushfire and Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre in partnership with the University of Wollongong, Western Sydney University and the University of Melbourne. My name is Dr John Bates. I'm the Research Director at the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC, and I'll be your MC for today. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from which we are all joining this meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to acknowledge the long association of traditional owners with their forests and grasslands. This webinar is being recorded for later online access. As attendees, you will receive an email when the video is available on the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC website in the coming days. We have three speakers this morning to launch the Prescribed Burning Atlas. And these speakers will describe to you what the atlas is and how you can use it and run through a detailed tour of the atlas so you can go away and learn to use it yourself. At the end of the session, we will have time for questions. So if there are questions you'd like to ask of our panelists, things you'd like to know about what the atlas can do and maybe what some of its limitations are, we'll have time to do that this morning. You can ask a question anytime using the Q&A function located on the toolbar near the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can, but it may not be possible to do all of them during the session today. If during the session you'd like to share your thoughts on social media, please use the hashtag PBAtlas. Before we get to our first speaker, I wanted to give you a quick overview of what the prescribed atlas is. The atlas is the culmination of a fairly significant project and it is presented to you as a website that presents options for prescribed burning strategies and can be used to help fire and land management agencies with their decisions around where and how to burn. It's a tool for both now and for the future and can show what is likely to be the most effective, what's likely to be most effective when it comes to prescribed burning for a given objective and where it might have limited value. The Atlas covers 13 different landscape types across New South Wales, the ACT, Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia and Queensland. And these landscapes include temperate forests, grasslands, savannas, deserts, woodlands and scrub. The Atlas has been developed by the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC with the University of Wollongong, Western Sydney University and the University of Melbourne. There are further developments planned for the Atlas to increase its application across a broader range of geographic areas around Australia. And Ross and Hamish will touch on this during their talks this morning. Now to launch the Prescribed Burning Atlas, I'd like to introduce Naomi Stevens. Naomi is a director and a member of the board of the Bushfire Natural Hazards CRC and Executive Director of Park Operations for New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service. Welcome, Naomi. Thank you very much, John, uh, and good morning to you all. Um, as John said, my name is Naomi Stevens, and I'm the Acting Executive Director for Park Operations for New South Wales Parks. I'm very pleased to be here today to launch the Prescribed Burning Atlas, um, representing both the New South Wales National Parks, but also importantly, in my capacity as a Director of the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC. I take great pleasure in introducing Ross and Hamish to present this work. It's a very significant accomplishment which will make a real contribution to the work of agencies such as mine and to future safety of the community and its assets. And it's a, a, a really great example of researchers responding to the needs of end user fire management agencies to address the difficult problem. Um, I'll only speak briefly because um, I'd really like to maximise the time available uh, for Ross and Hamish to present their work um, and there might might be slight repetition with what John said. It's very difficult for us to coordinate in a world where none of us can ever see each other in person. Um, but I'm very pleased to present the results of the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC project from hectares to tailor-made solutions for risk mitigation systems to deliver effective prescribed burning across Australian ecosystems. Uh, the issue addressed by the project is one that's not new, but it's clearly highly topical following the bushfire season of 2019-2020. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to bang on about the fact that it was unprecedented, but I think everything that can be said about that probably has been. Uh, but agencies and, and, and inquiries such as the one that we're having in New South Wales at the moment 
um, are considering the best use of prescribed burning for the future in an environment um, that has changed and clearly is continuing to do so. Uh, in our case, the New South Wales National Parks and the New South Wales Rural Fire Service are considering what is required to move from a predominantly hectare target-based approach to one that more effectively addresses risk mitigation in the future. And clearly, um, this project will contribute to that. Prescribed burning is a central feature of contemporary fire management, yet we struggle to establish a firm quantitative basis for understanding and comparing its effectiveness at mitigating risk across the landscape. By undertaking a systematic investigation of the drivers of prescribed burning effectiveness across southern Australia, the outcomes of this project will provide critical support to agencies such as mine in making decisions about when, where and how to apply prescribed burning to address risk. In this project, researchers from the University of Wollongong, Western Sydney Uni and the University of Melbourne have come together with end users across Southern Australia to design a project that systematically investigated how risk to any particular management value would respond to variations in the spatial location and the rates of treatment. The project outputs are available for use by end users using a dedicated tool, the Prescribed Fire Atlas, which will support the implementation of tailor-made prescribed burning strategies to suit the biophysical, climatic and human context of all bioregions across Southern Australia. Um, I'd really like to acknowledge the effort and time uh, of a range of representatives from many agencies, as well as the CRC and the researchers to develop uh, the outlets, because the success of a project like this uh, and its applicability to end users in the future is really dependent on those end users um, being prepared to contribute to the project. And in this case, um, agencies such as my own and the wider incarnation of the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service, Tasmanian Fire Service, ACT Parks and Conservation Service, South Australian Department of Environment and Water, Victorian Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, and the Victorian CFA, and no doubt others have all contributed to the Atlas's development, and they will be part um, of its ongoing success. Continued active involvement of, of end users throughout um, 2020 and beyond will be crucial in, in ensuring uptake and translation into the outcomes for end users and the communities um, that they serve. And there's a number of outstanding issues which the project will continue to address. The core focus of the Atlas is to support end users in the identification of optimal prescribed burning strategies tailored to local conditions and management objectives. There is also scope for the Atlas to have additional uses, including supporting education of and communication with stakeholders, both across agencies and also across the wider community. The Atlas is the first tool of its kind to present clear results showing that a given rate of prescribed burning does not deliver the same degree of risk mitigation for all values and the mitigation outcomes vary across landscapes and land use patterns. The ability to rapidly assess the impacts of different mitigation scenarios will improve fire management agencies' understanding of the comparative benefits of different fire management strategies in different circumstances. And it will support agencies in considering the cost benefit of prescribed burn programs, which is a bit of a holy grail for land management agencies. As always, the resources agencies have to manage the risk of bushfire are finite, and the possible work to be done is limitless with the support of this tool providing a better understanding of the comparative benefits of different fire management strategies in different circumstances, fire management agencies will be able to make better decisions about where those resources should be spent. So thank you very much to Hamish and um, Ross for the work and your team and teams for the work that you've done. And now I'd like to hand back to John um, to introduce the uh, presentation. Thank you.
Thank you, Naomi. And now I'd like to hand over to the lead researcher for this project from the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC. And that's someone who any of you who have been involved with bushfire research for, for any period of time probably know. And that's Professor Ross Bradstock from the University of Wollongong, who's going to formally introduce the Atlas to us. Welcome, Ross. Uh, you're, you're muted, Ross. You just. I think I'm unmuted now. Um, thank you so much for uh, um, such a, a comprehensive introduction, Naomi and John. And good morning to everyone, and thanks for attending. Um, I've just got to share my screen here. Okay. Um, the Atlas has uh, been uh, a long time in the making and has involved a whole bunch of people who are listed here. So I'd just like to acknowledge the contribution of my colleagues uh, for making this happen. Um, the Atlas, uh, I'm going to give a, a, just a general overview of the Atlas. In fact, Naomi's stolen a fair bit of my thunder um, in her um, very comprehensive and clear um, introduction but I'll reiterate some of the key points that she made um, uh, before handing over to Hamish, who, who will take you on a detailed tour of the sort of um, the functions and um, layout of uh, the Atlas. Um, the Atlas has an aim and um, here it is. So it's intended to provide a comprehensive formal estimation of risk to key human and environmental values. Um, across southern Australia um, and how risk may change in response to different prescribed burning strategies. By strategies we mean different rates of treatment and different spatial configurations uh, of treatment. Um, so uh, managers of course are faced with a plethora of options um, about how to go about um, using prescribed fire for fuel reduction and other um, management reasons. Um, but the most important thing, I guess, um, as Naomi has so, um, so well described, is that we are uh, functioning these days in a risk mitigation paradigm. Most agencies are signed up to uh, an ethos of risk management and risk mitigation. We undertake all sorts of different activities um, yeah, aimed at uh, mitigating the risks that bushfires pose to things that we value. So the Atlas is about understanding risk mitigation in response to prescribed burning and the range of potential strategies that are, are available to uh, managers to choose from. Um, if we're going to be in the business of risk management and risk mitigation, well, we have an obligation to quantify um, the, the amount of risk that we're reducing as a function of the activities that we're undertaking. And so the Atlas is intended to give us some view of the risk mitigation that may be achieved um, uh, from various options. Um, and so that's the overriding philosophy. It's about quantification and therefore it has a formal aspect. When you think about it, there's a lot of um, discussion about prescribed burning, um, its effectiveness, et cetera. But in the end, if we are, um, uh, in a world of risk mitigation, then the amount of risk mitigated by any particular approach to prescribed burning is the ultimate measure of effectiveness. In that regard, the Atlas gives you comparative insights into the risk mitigation potential of alternative strategies. And I would emphasize, in fact, that's probably one of the key features of the Atlas and it's would encourage you to, to view it and use it in a comparative manner. In some ways, the way in which different strategies compare in terms of their outcome is far more important than the overall numbers. Um, and so um, weighing up options, comparing options, thinking about how they may pan out, that's the value of the Atlas. Um, and I would encourage you to ponder it in that, in that way. 
Um, the Atlas um, delves into costs and it attempts to provide some estimation of how much any particular strategy is likely to cost and what the cost impacts are, and in particular, um, how those impact costs may change as a function of the you know, treatment rate and where you put those treatments um, in the landscape. So it provides an integration of both the outlays and, and the savings um, and the impact costs that may ensue from a particular choice. Um, these days, there's a lot of pressure on people to justify you know, ultimately the cost benefit and cost effectiveness of what they do. Um, so we hope that um, this type of information will provide the beginning of a, a, of a comprehensive picture of how prescribed burning can, can best perform in this regard. Um, the Atlas also contains some information about how climate change may affect the performance of different, different strategies. Um, and uh, you can, uh, Hamish will explain how, how that function works. Um, so it gives us some measure of what might happen in the future if we go down a particular pathway or how perhaps an alternative uh, strategy uh, may be a better option under climate change in the future. I'll very quickly summarise what the Atlas does um, now, um, what the fun key functions and purposes of it are now, and what it doesn't do. Um, and then I'll hint at perhaps uh, very briefly what could be done in the future. And Hamish is, is going to go into some of this in, in greater detail. I would emphasise right from the start, it's a, it's a decision support tool or system. It doesn't make decisions. Um, managers and policy makers are responsible for making decisions. Um, a thing like the Atlas just provides through its, particularly through its comparative insights, um, an informed basis for making decisions. But in the end, decisions are still made um, about values and, and choices and constraints, etc. cetera. Um, but it may provide um, a source of information that may help people make better decisions and better informed decisions but it does not make the decision for you. The Atlas primarily in its current form is, is a strategic um, uh, tool. Um, it gives you a big picture uh, view of the outcome of different strategies. It doesn't actually tell you which block to burn tomorrow um, or how to burn a block tomorrow. Um, but if you are gonna burn a block tomorrow, what it does is, is it tells you the value, the likely value of burning that block, particularly in a strategic context, assuming that the block you burn tomorrow, um, you know, is part of a, a, a wider strategy, um, a, a bunch of whole other areas uh, that are likely to be treated. So it provides the strategic context for your choices. Um, it's not a tactical thing in its current form. It's most important to understand that the Atlas is intended to provide customization. Um, in other words, uh, customized solutions um, based on biophysical context, uh, the climate, the vegetation, the fuels, and the configuration of um, various assets, human assets like people and property. Um, these things vary hugely across our uh, forest and woodland landscapes. Um, we uh, are managing fire across extraordinary gradients of these things. So we need um, tools like the Atlas to help us try and tailor make solutions that work best in terms of local context. And we hope the Atlas um, at least uh, provides some of that, um, uh, that material. At the moment, the Atlas is based, as John has indicated, on um, a whole bunch of case studies. Um, they're roughly all about sort of 200,000 hectares in size. Um, they are stratified to represent uh, or to populate those gradients that I alluded to. Um, at the moment, it doesn't provide a universal view of potential options across all landscapes, uh, but it focuses on those case studies. And you can use it um, you know, by analogy to um, various case studies if you're in a 
part of the world, you might like to look at the case study that you think best represents your situation um, to um, you know uh, check it out and, and and investigate you know what what the consequences of various things are. The atlas provides a view of risk and the response of risk to treatment that is long term. It's sort of roughly an average risk um, that is weighted by the chance of a whole bunch of things happening, the long term chance. Uh, or cal chance calculated in the long term, uh, uh, um, in a long term perspective. Um, so, for example, it takes into the, the into account the chances of different types of fire weather occurring based on local circumstances, um, ignition probabilities that we know of from um, extensive data analysis, etc. So, it gives you a very long term average view of risk, taking into account all the circumstances and probabilities. Um, that reflect your local circumstances or the local circumstances of each particular case study. It doesn't tell you what risk is tomorrow or how risk will change tomorrow or next week or even in any particular season, um, uh, but it gives that long-term perspective. And finally, um, at the moment, the climate change effects um, are represented by projected changes in fire weather only. Um, so those, those are the top-down uh, effects of um, climatic change, particularly higher temperatures, perhaps dryness in the future, um, on fire behaviour. Um, uh, and that's not going to be the total sum of climate change effects on fire management or, on, well, on, on, you know, landscapes and, and fire management. Um, there is huge potential for further development. And in particular, um, we have the capacity to build in a much more tactical focus to the Atlas to complement its strategic focus. Uh, we're working on ways of interpolating all the results of the Atlas um, between the areas represented by the case studies so that we have a complete set of solutions um, across southeastern Australia and southern Australia in particular. Um, so you won't be confined to the case studies. That works um, quite well advanced. Uh, we have been pulling out stuff which is uh, much more specifically focused in terms of risk. Uh, so, for example, we have been working on um, analysing what the risk might have been in response to prescribed burning at the beginning of last fire season in New South Wales. Uh, and so that sort of thing can be pulled out of here um, uh, with further effort. And um, there are ways of representing, for example, uh, effects of climate change on fuel dynamics, uh, which could potentially be incorporated into further iterations uh, of this um, of this system. So I'll leave it there and hand over to Hamish, um, and he will um, take you on a much more detailed tour. All right. Th thank you, Ross. Um, Ross, for those of you that are listening, was really the the person that conceived this idea, but the heavy lifting. Um, to actually deliver the Atlas today was was led by Hamish and a team of researchers who Hamish is representing for us today. So I'd now like to hand over to Dr. Hamish Clark from the University of Wollongong and Western Sydney University to introduce you to the Atlas and show you some of its features. Welcome, Hamish. Thanks very much, John. Uh, thanks to everyone uh, on the panel and thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, it's great to be here and it's great to see so many uh, participants listed down the bottom. I'd also like to extend my acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the country that I'm on at the moment and pay my respects to any Aboriginal people on the call today. Um, uh, it's great to have you all with us. So I'm going to give you a bit of a whirlwind tour of the Atlas as it currently stands. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge um, the core group of researchers uh, involved that you can see on your screen there. Uh, you can find some of us on Twitter if you're interested in wasting time there. Uh, and a big thank you, of course, to all our institutions who've supported us including the CRC and the Australian government through the CRC program. Uh, so, uh, excuse me, let's get this going. Uh, just to reiterate a few messages that you've already heard, but it never hurts to say, sing, say things three times. Um, it's a decision support tool, Prescribed Burning Atlas, um, a real focus on comparative analysis of different management options. Uh, that's what you need to do if you're interested in managing risk, understand the implications of strategies. 
Uh, we're interested in looking at risk mitigation across a portfolio of values. I'm going to uh, briefly uh, list them in a moment. Uh, but it's important to note that it's somewhat modular and uh, we're working already on other projects on additional values. That's something you might want to think about. Uh, the focus of the Atlas currently is on relative differences in risk, as Ross mentioned. Um, we're interested in knowing, uh, can you get a halving of risk? Can you get a 10% decrease? Um, that's the focus here rather than in absolute values. Uh, and related to that, uh, in pretty much every single case that we've looked at here, you're getting risk mitigation, not elimination. So there's always some residual risk. There's always some amount left over. And so that's very much a decision for uh, managers and society as to how much risk they're prepared to, to bear. Um, as we've also heard, the Atlas goes through not just um, these differences in risk, but the cost effectiveness of different strategies. And we've also got some estimates of the effects of climate change on our different strategies. Here's a welcome screen of the Atlas. Um, it's a large view of Australia and the case study locations that we have. Uh, you can toggle between different views, satellite views, for example. Uh, there's a few key areas uh, up the top that you can click on to navigate around. Uh, the about is just a background on the project, the team, you can find out a little bit more about Ross, myself and the others uh, from the, the team who've, who've driven uh, and uh, led this project. Uh, there's an FAQ which we're regularly adding to with some frequently asked questions, as well as a help section. We're just working on some videos now uh, that you can uh, click on to, to have a look at um, how to use it. You can get in touch with us. You can also find out publications, both scientific publications, uh, some of which are open access, um, uh, as well as uh, uh, various reports, annual reports, presentations uh, through the CRC. Uh, and the one down the bottom, possibly the one that uh, you're going to be most interested in, is the study areas. Uh, so once you click on that, you can then uh, pick a range of different, uh, from a range of different landscapes. Uh, and so now I'll just dive in and, and show what you can do. Uh, so here's the first thing that you can look at. You can look at a particular uh, value um, or, or effect of fire. In this case, it's the area of a wildfire. Uh, and we call this kind of a matrix plot. Uh, it's a bit of a grid. Uh, what you're looking at on the uh, x-axis is the rate of burning or prescribed burning in the landscape. And on the y-axis is the rate of prescribed burning at the edge or the interface. So closer to where people and, and houses are. Uh, it's a relative scale, so uh, we're starting with one, and then if you get a decrease in risk for a treatment, that number will decrease. If you get an increase in risk, uh, which is the case more for some of the environmental values that we've seen so far, that number will increase. Uh, so it gives you, in a snapshot, all of those combinations, I think it's 49 in total, from no treatment whatsoever up to high treatments, and you can then compare them. Uh, so in this particular case, we've got our do nothing option, zero treatment. And as I said, uh, that's defined as a risk level of one and everything else can be compared to that. Uh, I've also selected here uh, an option, which I've now labeled wrong because the axes have changed, but oh no, that's right, 3% at the edge and 1% at the landscape, and then 1% at the edge and 3% at the landscape. So two different options, two different levels of treatment um, at different locations. Uh, and you can see that there's a decrease in risk, slightly greater decrease when you do a bit more in the landscape than the edge for this particular case study location. As I mentioned, we have multiple values. So we've got the area of a wildfire, but then we've got all these other things. We've got uh, house loss, life loss. We've got power loss, which is the length of power line uh, damaged or affected by fire. Uh, similar one for roads, so the length of roads affected. Uh, and then we've got a measure of environmental um, um, so this is TFI burnt. TFI is tolerable fire interval. It's the area of, of the landscape that's been burnt below um, the, the threshold of vegetation uh, in terms of what they can uh, comfortably tolerate. Uh, so if, if some plants uh, and vegetation types are burnt too frequently, um, there can be negative consequences. So this is our estimate there. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are other ones available. So. Uh, if there's too much burning, you can go below this minimum tolerable fire interval threshold. Uh, so another um, uh, view of the results uh, is what we're calling a spider plot. Um, uh, and this shows all of those values at the same time. Uh, so the one we were just looking at before was fire area. That's sitting there at 12 o'clock. 
But we've also got house loss at about two o'clock, life loss at about four, road loss down at six o'clock, um, power line length at uh, eight o'clock, and then area burnt below minimum of fire interval up there about 10 o'clock. Uh, so there's three bar, three colors there um, and three shapes. Uh, and because we're looking at relative risk, the smaller shape is better. So when you do more treatment, you'll get a different uh, shape uh, of, of results. In this particular case, you can see that the fire area, uh, as you might have remembered from the previous one, was sitting at one for no treatment. And then our two other options are about 0.8 and 0.7. Uh, you can see that the other values have responded similarly, but not identically. Uh, in particular, um, none of those uh, strategies are having much of an effect on area burnt below minimum tolerable fire interval whereas they're having much more of an effect on those other values. So this lets you look at all of those at the same time and the shape of it tells you which ones are responding more or less. Uh, we've also got a tool that lets you fix treatment at a different, different level. So in particular, what happens if you hold edge, landscape, edge treatment fixed at a certain amount and then vary landscape and vice versa. So what you can see in the top left there is we've clicked on edge, we're holding it at uh, two, 2% treatment, and that corresponds to that whole row of the previous uh, matrix plot I was showing you before. So we're holding that fixed, and then over here on the right, we're looking at how, in this case, house loss varies as we increase landscape treatment. So all these are with a fixed amount, 2% of edge. And you can see, in this particular case, risk uh, decreasing with increasing treatment. Uh, obviously you can vary the amount of edge treatment and you can also swap to what we have in this case, which is holding the landscape level of treatment fixed. So here it's effectively uh, just one column of that matrix plot, 2% of the landscape. And now we're looking at how risk responds to increasing edge treatment. So that's another uh, tool within the Atlas that you can look at. We've also got, as I mentioned, a climate change function. Uh, so there's just a little button down the bottom. You can click on that and toggle it on and off. And what you get are two lines, a red line and a green line. And they respond to upper and lower scenarios from a climate change um, model ensemble. So the red line tells you basically the uppermost or worst case scenario. The green line tells you the lower. These vary across landscapes uh, and values. Broadly speaking, our best case scenarios are fairly similar to where we're sitting at the moment. Worst case scenarios tend to be a bit worse. Um, to give you an example, uh, looking here at uh, this particular bar, um, when we fixed our treatment at 2% of the landscape and are at 1% of the edge, we get this particular risk reduction. Under our worst case climate change scenario, we need to move all the way over there to between three and 5% treatment to get the same level of risk reduction. So that's the climate change function of the Atlas, allowing you to explore different climate futures, some high and low scenarios, and the effects on different values. Uh, cost effectiveness uh, is the other one. So we have another tool for that. Again, you can fix your edge or landscape treatment at a certain amount, and then look at the change in cost for these different strategies. So in this particular example, we're looking at total cost. And one of the things that you can see is that we've broken them down by, um, where we've kind of shaded them uh, for the different things that they represent. So importantly, um, we've got our cost of treatment as well as our cost uh, of the impact of a wildfire. So sitting at the top there, oh sorry, I should also mention, we've also got a, a least cost option. So across all of uh, total costs as well as the individual ones, whether it's house loss or cost of treatment, you can see whereabouts the kind of least cost option is, and that's marked by the red line. Uh, but as I was saying, uh, importantly, we're dividing it into the treatment costs, which are in this case here, you can see the kind of yellow is the cost of landscape treatment, which increases as you do more landscape treatment, uh, as well as the next shade of green down, which is our edge costs. All of the other ones refer to our impact costs. So you can separate it out. And yeah, it's, it's important to take both of those into account if you're interested in, in tallying all of the costs. Um, they're the main features of the Atlas that I wanted to take you through today. Uh, as alluded to, we have some other stuff uh, hopefully coming in the pipeline. Um, as Ross mentioned, we're looking at extending beyond the case study areas. So we've got a methodology for that. Um, 
right now you just need to look at case studies and and try and consider similarities between where you are but we've got uh, a way of uh, trying to to make you basically be able to click anywhere uh, in the landscape and estimate the risk for different uh, treatment options there uh, as well as adding new features uh, and potentially even data from other projects uh, and that's going to be very much in response to feedback from uh, you the users uh, so a very important message we want to hear from you fire managers We'd love it if you registered, explored the case studies and the treatment options. Uh, feedback is extremely welcome and indeed needed. Uh, bugs are inevitable, sadly, but um, we'll, we'll respond to them and fix them as they arise. Uh, and we'd love to know which features you want to, you'd like to see. Uh, but even beyond that, um, how we can help you to make best use of the atlas. Um, so a few seconds before I wrap up. Um, uh, Definitely one of the main ones from our project is there is no one size fits all solution to prescribe burning. All of these local factors, climate, vegetation, distribution of assets, they all influence the risk mitigation available from prescribed burning. And in particular, the most cost effective solutions are not the same everywhere. So in the Blue Mountains, just as an example, we've got a particular scenario here, 1% of the landscape. And as you move up to more edge, you're getting a lower cost in total, that red line. Over here in southeast Queensland, the pattern is going in the opposite direction where more edge treatment is not giving you more bang for your buck relative to speaking. That's just an example. Um, so yeah, our prescribed burning solutions need to be tailored. And the message so far from these climate change results, which as we know, don't include all um, factors, but weather is really an important one. Um, it tends to reduce the prescribed burning effect in this requiring a greater investment to achieve the same results. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Love to open it up for Q&A for the whole panel. And um, some of you may be wondering how to actually find the Atlas. We'll try and mention that again at the end, but uh, this is the URL, um, prescribedburnatlas.science. So it's a different, it's not .com or .net or .org, it's .science. Uh, there it is, prescribedburnatlas.science, and I'll hand back to John. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hamish. Uh, now it's time for, for us to get into some Q&A. Uh, and I thought I'd just... Uh, the very first question that came through today was just asking um, how people got access to it. Hamish has given you the URL and it, it's freely accessible. Um, it, it's open to anyone that wants to go in and have a look at it. And if you want to engage with the research team, there's a contact us page uh, on the, the website and you can get in touch with the research team directly through that one. Uh, I might start off Hamish, there's some questions that have come through, just questions around what's the edge and what does edge treatment mean? So it might be worthwhile describing what you mean when you talk about landscape treatment, edge treatment, and how an edge might be defined. Uh, so there's a technical definition, which I don't have to hand on me right now, I'm sorry, but it's basically, uh, there's this concept of the wildland urban interface, um, which is, it's really where, where people meet the bush, where people meet vegetation that can burn. And so if you zoom in on a landscape, you can see that there are some areas, um, the more remote areas where there's a lot of vegetation and not many, if any, people. And then there's a lot of areas um, that are really skirting around houses, settlements, cities. So it's defined as a function of population density and, and housing structures. Um, I can come back to the speakers with a, with a, a the questioner with a more detailed definition. Um, but importantly, it re represents two different um, kind of types of strategy and costs of strategy. Um, and maybe Ross wants to add to that. Um, yeah, I'll, I will simply add to that um, by saying that all the work that the Atlas is based on uses burn blocks in the case study landscapes, which have been defined by the uh, relevant management agencies. And so you, you can, um, uh, what, we're, what we're doing is distinguishing between uh, potential burning blocks that are adjacent you know, uh, close to assets, um, such as developments and suburbs, etc., uh, versus burn blocks that are out in the boondocks that are not directly adjacent to, um, you know, uh, human developments. Uh, so that's the fundamental dichotomy, but it does come back down to burn blocks. Um, so the whole thing is based on the reality of the, of the bits of the landscape that um, are carved up uh, uh, and recognised as burning blocks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Ross. Uh, Naomi, just to, to sort of look at, at this then from a perspective of someone who, who actually manages those, those, land, those landscapes out in the environment, do you have any, or are you able to share with us any sense of, from a New South Wales Parks point of view, how important 
in your thinking edge burning and landscape burning is in your prescriptions as you put forward prescribed planning? Uh, currently, or Cur uh, currently. In, or, or currently, obviously, um, we um, we tend to combine um, edge burning and um, broad scale burning, and we really. Um, it's usually based on the size of the block we're addressing or what the objectives of the burn are. From an ecological perspective, we, um, we're interested in, in, in landscape burning in a way that pr protects the air and enhances the ecological values. Uh, but also there's a, a sense that we're looking to um, have strategies in place that ensure that fires don't spread un uncontained across large parts of our parks. When we get closer into the um, urban interface, uh, edge burning really is the basis for on, on which we burn currently. So we're very interested to have a look at some of um, the outcomes that we've got from relevant case studies in the Atlas to see if, if there's another approach we could be taking. I mean, edge burning, um, Obviously, ABZ and and the strategic fire asset zones both contribute um, very significantly currently to what we understand are strategies that are addressing and mitigating risk. It's just a, a matter of having a look and seeing whether the results that have come through in the Atlas support what we're currently doing and how we can make changes to that in the future to, to get better outcomes. Yeah, thank you. Hamish, are you able to go through and just describe briefly the case study areas that you've used and, and what what the features of them are? Uh, sure, yeah, let me see if I can pull up a, a map there. Um, maybe I can share my screen briefly. Might make it easier. Uh, so we've got, um, yeah, as, as Ross said, they're stratified in different ways. Maybe the simplest way is to talk about um, those that are kind of peri-urban, close to large um, settlements those that are more regional, mixed land use, and those that are kind of more remote and some arid areas. So our ones that are close to settlements are um, up here in southeast Queensland, uh, Blue Mountains, west of Sydney. Uh, we've got Canberra uh, and to, to the west, the Brindabellas. Um, we're down here in Hobart as well, up at Mount Lofty in Adelaide, as well as um, arguably the east central Victoria, another peri-urban one. Uh, we've then got our kind of mixed mixed land use areas. Um, so that's southeast corner, lots of forests down on the border of um, Victoria, but that's in New South Wales. Southwestern slopes and the Nandiwa region, so inland um, in New South Wales. Uh, and then we've got our more kind of arid and remote ones, uh, Broken Hill, western New South Wales. Uh, this one calling murray Darling Depression up in inland South Australia, as well as out in the desert, um, Mamangari. Uh, and then in the west of Victoria, uh, Little Desert. Um, they've, they've all got different climates. So, I mean, in terms of the climate, um, you know, there's a mixture between temperate and Mediterranean and, and more arid. Um, uh, there's probably other features that I'm not thinking of too. I don't know, Ross, if you want to add to any of them. John, does that answer your question? It does. Thank, thank you, Hamish. Um, so, so like, we've had a, a couple of questions that have come through just to try to understand the... Um, the approach has been taken to to put a value against the risk that comes through. Um, and one of them in particular, looking at whether the cost to life included smoke or not. So I guess if you could just maybe look at, at a couple of things, look at the, the, lot, the effect on life and perhaps the effect on um, property, how were they calculated by the system and, and how, did, how do you translate the treatments through fire to the outcome? Uh, oh, sorry, Ross, yeah, go for it. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to um, uh, uh, give the beginning of an answer and you can amplify me, Hamish. Um, all the work has been done using simulation uh, based on Phoenix Rapid Fire. And uh, so uh, Phoenix Rapid Fire is the engine where we simulate wildfires and we uh, interpose the treatments and examine uh, the outcome. And there's a whole bunch of functions which uh, link the output from Phoenix to the values that um, you've seen represented. Um, so, and uh, the costs are derived from the literature as it stands at the moment. So for example, uh, the cost of, uh, of a house is uh, valued at half a million dollars. 
and the cost of a human life is $4.2 million. Um, uh, so it's those sorts of numbers that have gone into um, the mix and uh, that's a standardized um, uh, estimation that's uh, you know, used quite commonly in uh, natural hazards research and, and, and uh, policy making, et cetera. Um, so that, that drives the outcomes that you see. You might like to say a little bit more, Hamish. Um, yeah, so in this particular case, I'm not sure if you mentioned, I've just got some vacuuming going on the background, sorry. Um, the, the literature on life loss is related to house loss. So they're actually very closely related in this case. Um, specifically on smoke, it is not included. Um, we're working on that in a separate project. And as I mentioned, it, it's very much modular. So as better models for these different uh, values come in, we can incorporate them and we can add more. Um, so there's a reasonable amount of research now that links uh, well, not just wildfire smoke, but prescribed fire smoke to human health impacts and economic costs associated with that. Thanks, thanks, Hamish. And it's probably fair to say this this atlas is a first iteration, a way of trying to relate what we can do in prescribed fire and how that will have an impact on bushfire. We've talked about a whole lot of other values in this project and others that could be put into it. One of the challenges is trying to say, what are the triggers? How can we model that based on the inputs and the outputs that we have? It's not a simple thing. Um, Hamish. Yeah, I'll just add, uh, Trent's reminded me, uh, you can find all the details of uh, how the values were calculated, uh, how the costs were calculated in the FAQ, uh, and more detail uh, in the publications. Um, so if you go to the, the Atlas, there's a publications tab and you can you can find some papers yeah. and reports yeah. which go into all the gory detail. Yeah, thank you. So I've had a question come in um, that, that says, it's a great approach to decision support. How does the model account for the time of implementation of the treatment and eventual risk mitigation? Would it seem important to estimate cost effectiveness as it's not a single treatment, it is requirement for multiple treatments over time? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to have first crack at that, if you like, Russ. Um, as, as Russ said, it is very much um, a strategic kind of ongoing or, or averaged type of risk. It's not about if you do it, what will your outcome be this season? It's, a, it's kind of a, assuming that you're going to impl implement a certain strategy through a longer term period. Uh, and so the treatments that we've put in, in our simulations have been over many years and it's only then at which these effects uh, can be kind of discerned. If you're doing a completely different treatment type and you want to measure you know, in six months or a year what the effects are, you're probably not going to see the outcome of all that. Um, not sure if answered the question, but um. yeah. But I guess uh, you know my, my sense is the way the atlas was put together. It mm -hmm. took in, into account ongoing and regular burning using a, mm -hmm. using the, the formula that was used for, for that, and a range of, of fires under a range of fire weather conditions. Yes, that, that through some of the work that Trent and his team have done, mm -hmm. give us a I guess a, a statistical output from that. Is that? We, so we are trying to integrate across all of the different weather categories. So some, sometimes these kinds of exercises are only done, say, under extreme or severe or catastrophic weather, whereas we've actually looked at the full range of, of fire weather that you'll get during a fire season in all of our case study landscapes, and we've, we've, we've built that into it, so to speak. So in these estimates are, you know, the relative frequency of those high and low fire danger days. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the, other, the other thing I will add um, uh, also is each of the case study landscapes, we've used a base layer of fire history that more, more or less reflects the, the range of fuel ages that um, you know, are evident um, that are contemporary in those landscapes um, as a function of the comings and goings of the fires, um, et cetera. So that's also factored in as well. Yep. Thank you. Uh, there's a question come in that, that's asking, the Atlas looked like it looks like it is currently rather broad as far as areas. Using the Blue Mountains as, as an example, the whole thing seems to follow the same relationships. This seems overly simplistic, i.e. the northern and southern side of the highways have very different risks. Uh, can you talk to that? You pick one landscape and, and maybe the, the Blue Mountains is a good example of that. H how have you dealt with variation that might exist across those large landscapes as far as the atlas is concerned? Um, so the atlas is very much focused on the, this strategic broader perspective. So the results are per landscape, if you like, 
Um, as Ross mentioned, the data we've produced is quite a large amount, you know, into the hundreds of thousands of simulations um, for each landscape. We can go in there and look at some individual um, place-based effects, you know, such as north or south of the highway. I mean, the Blue Mountains is interesting too because it's it's quite unusual for most of our landscapes and maybe others around southern Australia in that there's essentially one major road and settlement that go, cuts through it and there's a huge chunk of, of landscape. Um, not, not all of them are like that. Um, but yes, you know, local details absolutely do matter. Um, we're trying to estimate the broader effects that are consistent across the landscape. Um, so as it stands now, yes, it is at a landscape scale, but um, there is the potential of pulling out exactly those kinds of details, asking, for example, if you're treating it at this distance from blocks or at this kind of elevation or things like that. Mm -hmm. That's not how it's currently intended or framed. I don't know if you want to add to that, Ross. Yeah, um, yeah. in that particular case, it integrates um, the variation that um, uh, exists in that part of the world. It you know, integrates across that variation. Um, but in the end, um, also planning, uh, etc., takes place roughly at that scale. Um, planning may have layers of nuance and focus on those um, you know, finer, finer grained variations but it at least gives you something that is resonant with the sort of level of scale of contemporary planning. Um, that's why I would emphasize this is a strategic um, device at the moment, which is operating at that sort of policy and planning level rather than more um, finer grain tactical level. It's not to say that those concerns aren't legitimate, um, and, but that's, it's also got material in there that can be drilled into, um, as Hamish has indicated, uh, in the future. Yep. Thanks, Ross. Um, there, there was a question that, or, that says, it looks like you can only select edge or landscape. Can you select both? And the answer is you can select both when you're in the online system. Um, it, it allows you to look at, at all of those sorts of things. And, and probably the, the last question for, for Ross and, and for Hamish for the morning is, um, Phoenix Rapid Fire is a fundamental engine behind this and the question is are we doing anything to increase the accuracy of phoenix rapid fire given it's a critical part of the horsepower behind this atlas i've got a crying kid in the background so i might let ross have the first crack on that <laughs> yeah look there are um phoenix phoenix rapid uh, fire is you know um, like all models it's really badly flawed um uh, but it's better than nothing and uh, uh, yeah, look, there is work going on in terms of um, not only uh, refinement of things like Phoenix, but um, you know, using alternative modeling platforms, et cetera. Um, so this, you know, this is um, the, field, the whole field of fire modeling and the application of fire behavior into landscape level simulation is an incredibly exciting and, and rapidly evolving field. One of the big challenges is not so much even tinkering with the details of things like Phoenix, but it's getting phenomena uh, like uh, pyroconvective fires properly represented into these sorts of simulation platforms. Mm -hmm. So it's a crude instrument. Um, that's why we suggest that people focus on the comparative results. Uh, in the end, any model is just a, a simplification of reality. And they're best treated as, you know, the out outputs of models like this are best treated as, uh, you know, as a way of viewing alternatives um, and weighing up alternatives um, rather than getting fixated on the, on the absolute numbers. So refinements are occurring. There are huge modeling challenges in the fire modeling field. Uh, and we will see rapid development of things like that. Um, you know, we may be here in five years' time, we may have an atlas, but it may be powered by a completely uh, different engine um, than the one we've got at the moment. Thanks, Ross. So we're getting close to the end now, and I thought I might just go across uh, you, you and Ross and Hamish, first of all, before I go to Naomi. When you, in the work that's been done in, in bringing the atlas together, was there something that surprised you in that development when you saw it? And what do you think is the most compelling thing that the, the Atlas will be able to do for people that they couldn't do before? Yeah, good question, John. Um, I think just looking at the, the results of some of the case study landscapes um, has been fascinating. Um, 
uh, we published a paper um, with some of the initial results comparing um, landscapes in uh, Hobart and uh, in the ACT. And the treatment, not only were you seeing differences in relative treatment, for example, you know, you could get close to a 50% reduction in risk in, I think it was the ACT, but not really in Hobart. But each of the values weren't even following the same path. So you could get relatively greater effect on house loss in Hobart, I think, than the ACT in some cases. So just those individual details were interesting and surprising for me. Um, and I can't remember what the second part of your question was. Uh, what, what's the most compelling feature of the, of the Atlas? So if you say to people, you need to use it because you can do this, what, I think what it's getting. It's really just getting people to be thinking in terms of quantifying risk and, and you know, put, putting your cards on the table if I, if I do this kind of treatment and then asking how it changes. And as, as we've said, you know, there's limitations to the modelling, but hopefully by getting people to think explicitly about this stuff, about comparing strategies, um, you know, we can start working towards, you know, helping um, decision makers uh, make better informed decisions. Yeah, thank you. Ross, from your perspective? Um, yeah, look, um, the cost stuff is very interesting. It has a lot of, lots of interesting surprises and twists. Some things are a little bit counterintuitive when you um, go and have a good look in there. And the other thing I would note um, is the climate change uh, capacity that's in there is very sobering um, uh, because it really tells us how immense the challenge of climate change is. When you see that rightward shift that Hamish illustrated in that example, when you see that play out across many of these uh, examples that are in the Atlas at the moment, um, you know, it's a reality check for all of us um, and uh, it's uh, uh, very sobering. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's something that we've got to confront. Yeah, thanks, Ross. And Naomi, I know that New South Wales Parks and Wildlife Service, along with a whole lot of the other land management agencies, have been involved in the development of the Atlas. How easy do you think it will be for, for your agency to bring this in and start to use it as part of your decision support for your prescribed burning programs? Um, I think we've got a very high level of um, understanding that the, that the Atlas is there and it's now a tool for us. We've got an existing relationship, obviously, with Ross and Hamish. Mm. Uh, look, just reflecting on what Ross, Ross just said about climate change, uh, you know, we've just been through a fire season and every single member of the 1,200 people from my organisation who were part of that bushfire response effort would tell you that they saw the impacts of climate change uh, d daily um, and, and to know that, that the Atlas might contribute to our understanding of where that's headed into the future so we can plan and get ahead of the game to prepare ourselves in, or aspects um, of our work to prepare for that continuing change is a reason why we'll look at it very closely. I think there's real value for us immediately in the comparative aspects of looking at different strategies uh, and, and what their value might be in terms of managing risk and also managing the ecological values of our reserves. I think we're also very interested in the potential that it has in the future. The fact that it can look at things like smoke impacts, um, which is very topical in New South Wales um, and, and numbers of other things. So we're, we're not just interested in what it has to offer us now, we're really interested in the potential that it has for us um, to support our decision making uh, in the future. Thanks Naomi. And, and there was a question that, that I didn't get to that was looking at um, mechanisms and methods other than using fire to reduce fuel. It, it certainly there is the potential to bring that into the type of thinking that's, that's as part of the Atlas. This, this is step one, I think, of, of providing information. And, you know, the, the, a lot of what we've learned in the past has been from uh, running fires, looking at what happens. Now we've got a tool that allows us to use modelling that, to understand some of the dynamics that are out there and, and they'll be validated against what's happening in the field. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I, I've been following this project for a while and, and having had an opportunity to look through the website uh, as it's been developing, you know, some of the things to me is that there are places where just putting more time and money into burning makes very little difference to the impact. Mm -hmm. And there are places where you reach a threshold and you get a significant benefit and, and putting more money goes in. And it's trying to understand those and what's driving those decisions that will help us you know, better inform what we're doing in prescribed burning and managing fuel loads, but also to know when putting more investment in is not worthwhile. And I think you know, some of those decisions, particularly saying we've burnt enough, is a challenging one because 
you know, defining what enough is is a, is a really challenging prospect. And, mm-hmm. and we've touched on climate change and the amount of time we have now to, to do those those fuel reduction burns is, is potentially shrinking. So the, the more nuanced and the more uh, aware we can be of the decisions, I think is a really important thing. Um, so look, I, I would like to thank uh, everyone who's been a participant today. That's been a, a fabulous to have you all on board. The, um, the panel have done a fabulous job in sharing the Atlas with you. There was a question coming through saying, what's the link to the prescribed burning Atlas? Uh, it's up on screen now. Um, we will make the, um, the slides available on our website as we'll make the, um, the recording of this session available on the website in coming days. And those, those links will be sent out to everybody who's participated this morning. Uh, the social media hashtag is on the bottom, PBA Atlas. Uh, with that, I would really like to thank Naomi for, for opening the session and being here to support us as an end user and someone who is a beneficiary of the research that's being done. Ross, thank you for the idea and for getting this project off the ground. And to Hamish and the team, you've done an awesome job. I think if I think back to the time that I joined the CRC and I asked, what is this Atlas thing? Um, there have been some, some really good conversations and I think the product that you've got is a real testament to what you and the, the crew have been able to do in, in putting together something which is a complex set of thinking. And really, I hope now will, will help uh, both private and public landowners in understanding their environment and what they can do. So from everybody at the CRC, thank you all and thank you for everyone who's been part of this uh, webinar today. Mm-hmm.